on our website and or on other social media platforms, uh, for example, YouTube, Facebook, etc. In doing so, the MSA is not asking for ownership of any intellectual property that might be pertinent to your video or audio participation. Your granting permission does not detract from any intellectual property rights you have in connection with the paper you presented or the ideas you expressed at the meeting. You know, so should you ask a question, make a comment. Um, should that not be uh, uh, in order with everyone, um, then you know, be advised that the recording is going to start now or it just has. Um, otherwise, I would ask that, you know, um, people mute themselves until it's time to ask questions at the end. You can raise either a physical or a vir virtual hand. I'll do the best I can to keep a, a proper K going. Uh, and if should you be interested in presenting in the future, uh, all there's a call for papers, in other words, and all the papers will be vetted uh, by a committee, uh, just like they would for any sort of, you know, conference venue or the like. Uh, but you can send those to me at secretary at metaphysicalsociety.org. I can type that in the chat, actually. Might make our lives easier. Let me try that. Secretary at metaphysicalsociety.org. But we would ask that presentations, if they're papers, that they be approximately 10 to 12 pages in length or not longer. Or if you have a different sort of, sort of style and you don't want to read a paper, that's also fine, but the sort of time frame should give you an idea of 10 to 12 pages. Good. Otherwise, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, which is uh, Dr. David Weissman. Uh, he is the current vice president of the Metaphysical Society of America. He teaches at the City College of New York, and his paper is entitled, Are We Trapped in Plato's Cave? Thank you, Tyler. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to tell you what's in the paper because nobody need to have read it. It's very simple. In fact, it may be too simple. And having summarized the paper briefly, but fulsomely, I hope, um, I'm going to ask what implications it has for metaphysics, something that is not in the paper. Let me begin with uh, the title, Are We Trapped in Plato's Cave? which requires or presupposes that one knows something about the cave. So let me tell you in summary what the cave is about. It's a cave. In the back, people are um, facing the back of the cave with their necks in uh, something that keeps them from moving. So all they can see are shadows. The shadows move. Uh, the reason they move is that statues are being carried near a fire by people who talk and move. The, 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 the things are moving, the, um, and therefore the shadows are all the less reliable as sources of information. Someone who is trapped at the back of the cave is now somehow released and looks behind him or her and sees the light of the fire and is blinded by it. And that's a critical point in this because successively one becomes comfortable in a community of discourse and believes that reality is as that discourse makes it out to be. So before one was comfortable in whatever had passed as a compelling story uh, about the shadows and now one sees that that is um, not a good story anymore because one sees be one's eyes become acclimated to the fire and sees the statues being carried. And one now realizes that they are a superior level of reality. In Plato, there are levels of reality. And the person who has now been liberated from the back of the cave moves toward the mouth of the cave. And as he or she gets closer to the mouth is again blinded by the light of the sun until eyes are uh, acclimated again and he or she walks out of the cave and sees the forms in the light of the sun, which is the which is the good. Before returning to the cave out of guilt to show those that are out of uh, desire to show to the, those still at the back of the cave what reality really is, and uh, his or her eyes are poorly acclimated to the darkness at the back. He is thought to have blinded him or herself by um, walking, leaving the back, and now the people at the back want to kill him or her. Now, what's that about? Um, one is trapped in one's prejudices. There are three facts about the back of the cave. Um, 
or four, a first fact about the back of the cave is that no one takes it seriously. It's pure illusion. No one wants to be in the back of the cave. But I want to point out three aspects of life at the back of the cave before saying that Kant and Quine are at the back of the cave and are happy to be there. The three facts are one, one makes no sense of the shadows until imagination gives them an identity. That identity gets translated into words, having been directed by some sense of the good. Plato's clear that the, um, the people who tell the stories have two motives. One is to uh, win honor from one another by having had the best story. Another is to share a view of one's reality with other people in the cave. So there are those three facts which are characteristic of life at the back of the cave, and I want to repeat them. Imagination creates the identity of the shadows. The identity gets expressed in words, and the choice of, imag uh, of imaginings, the story one tells, is directed by some notion of the good, a desire, an interest, something of the sort. Now, that's to say that imagination and social psychology are determining as regards the kind of world in which we live. Who thinks that? Well, let me start with Kant. Kant thinks it. In a passage that is, I think, little known, I want to read you a bit of it. I have been reproached for following a similar procedure, namely, for defining the power of desire as the power of being the cause through one's presentations of the actuality of the objects of these presentations. Desire determines how I schematize my reality. I, I, I could say that three times, but it would be the same point. It is as imagination makes it out to be. Mind is the schematizer, but desire determines how I schematize it. What kind of world, in what, in what sort of world do I wish to live? And imagination decides. Imagination is emphasized in the A deduction more than in the B deduction of the first critique, but imagination provides not just the data, but the schematization of the data. This gets into a bit of uh, Kantian exegesis, but schematization overrides data in Kant. Uh, in, in the Marburg school of neo-Kantianism, but also in Kant himself in the B deduction. So what imagination decides to make of the data, it makes, and we then convert that into a story which we, which we tell or can tell. Kant doesn't emphasize words, he emphasizes grammatical structure, but it comes to the same thing. Grammatical structure determines what sense is made of the imaginings. They are the schemas which form the imaginings. Now let me pass on to um, my favorite philosopher, Willard Van Orman Quine. And let me read you um, something from Word and Object. Carnap has long held that the questions of philosophy, when real at all, are questions of language. And the present observations would seem to illustrate his point. He holds that the philosophical questions of what there is are questions of how we most conveniently fashion our linguistic framework, and not as in the case of the wombat or unicorn, questions about extra linguistic reality. He holds that those, quest those philosophical questions are only apparently about sorts of objects and are really pragmatic questions of language policy. But why should this be true of the philosophic questions and not of theoretical questions generally? Such a distinction of status is of a piece with the notion of analyticity and as little to be trusted. After all, theoretical sentences in general are defensible only pragmatically. We can but assess the structural merits of the theory which embraces them along with sentences directly conditioned to multifarious stimulations. That's word and object. Now I want to find, show you something from on what there is and from a logical point of view. This is the last paragraph from on what there is. From among the various conceptual schemes best suited to these various pursuits, one, the phenomenalistic claims epistemological priority. 
Viewed from within the phenomenalistic conceptual scheme, the ontologies of physical objects and mathematical objects are myths. Now this is a critical sentence. The quality of myth, however, is relative, relative in this case to the epistemological point of view. This point of view is one among various corresponding to one among our various interests and purposes. Quine, like Kant, is a bit of a pragmatist. That is to say, the kind of world in which we live is determined by the language in which we live. Both Kant and Quine share the structure of the back of the cave. Their determinations as to what there is have the three aspects. Imagination considers what desire wants and then expresses it in language or words. So the story we tell is a contrivance. If you read, um, if you read uh, Word and Object, you very quickly get the notion that reality is nothing apart from the conceptual system used to characterize or express it. That was true at the back of the cave, it's true in Kant, and it's true in Quine. And by the way, it's true in Carnap. Uh, empiricism, semantics, and ontology is, is the point of reference for Quine. And, um, it is straight, straight Marburg Kantianism, which means the emphasis is not on uh, receptivity, intuition, but rather on conceptualizations which give shape to the data of sense. The data of sense have no um, intelligibility apart from the schematism, the conceptualization, and the conceptualization gives us the reality, such reality as the world is, is thought to have. That's all I have to say about the short paper, except for the last section, which is about um, pragmatics called frustration. Now I want to draw some lessons from metaphysics. There are two readings of the cave allegory. One as Plato wrote it, and another that you get from attaching the Mino to the allegory of the cave. As Plato wrote it, you come out of the cave in order to see the forms. As Mino shows, the forms are already in us as innate ideas. And that implies that we need never come out of the cave in order to see the forms. What we have, therefore, with the Mino attached to the allegory is Descartes' cogito, for which, for which clear and distinct ideas are the way to knowledge, all of which are available to the, eye, to the mind as it reflects upon itself and its content. Now, what's the difference? What is metaphysics if the allegory of the cave tied to Mino is just Descartes' cogito? What is metaphysics? Well, two things, I suppose. One, it can be a kind of phenomenology in which you look for the schematic um, design-like features of experience within the data of experience. From the back of the cave all the way up to clear and distinct ideas. Everyday experience becomes the point of reference for the analysis of what you might allege to be metaphysical. But more powerfully, you get it from the A and the B deduction of the first critique, examples of it. It would be a, an account of the conditions for experience, for thought. And I must say, reading the A and the B deductions is quite a lesson in the intensity of a certain kind of metaphysical discourse. This is metaphysics as process. Um, I think it puts Whitehead to shame, excuse me, for those of you who like Whitehead a lot. Um, it is extraordinarily powerful. Now, what sense are we to make it given that Kant has said that cause and effect are simply the, uh, the conjunctions, and, and ex conjunctions and experience a la Hume of data? Well, Kant has a notion of causality which is transcendental as well as empirical. And what he means by the transcendental is the causal because he's specifying in these, in the A and the B deduction, the conditions for experience, causal conditions for experience, even though he alleges they occur spontaneously. So that's one way to go. Find within the cave, all the, the cave extended to include the forms, both the content of experience in its schematic aspects and the activities of mind insofar as mind creates this experience. Now, I don't myself favor this sort of metaphysics, 
I like the one that's implicit in the original statement of the allegory. The original statement has, is quite extraordinary for coupling something at the back of the cave, which is only a function of what mind does or says of itself about reality, and coming out of the cave to something not in mind. And that is the, uh, that's entree to two kinds of extra mental uh, phenomena. One is practical life, practical experience. It seems to me that there are lots of examples in practical life for which one can make no sense whatever within the cave. And I wanna give you a couple of them. One is tripping in the dark. You may be aware experientially of, of falling, of uh, banging your head against the floor or something, but on what did you trip? It seems very difficult within the cave to make any sense of something tripped on. And now two others. Collaboration. There are lots of expressions of collaboration. Here's one that I like and I use in that short paper. Suppose I have a toothache, a severe pain, but I know nothing about dentistry. All I know is that I have a, a very painful something in my mouth. So I go see a dentist who says, tell me where it is and you go like this. And the dentist says, yes, dentist says, yes I see it. And then fixes it. What does that say about the tooth? Well, Aristotle had a phrase for it. He called it a common sensible. And it seems to me that the identification of the common sensible in space says something about space as a neutral medium for encountering other people and other things well beyond the mind. That's one example. Here's another. Suppose you have, uh, this is another example of collaboration. Suppose you're having a conversation with someone with whom you disagree. Everything he or she says, you don't agree with. And she or he has the same experience of you. Here in collaboration, we have two people, neither of whom has created the other, neither of whom um, has a sense of reality that corresponds to or correlates with the other sense of reality. How do we explain this correlation? Nothing that I can imagine in the allegory of the cave, I mean, in the back of the cave, or in Descartes' Kogito explains it. And I'm not sure how any of these subjectivist idealists would explain it. Now inquiry. Inquiry is the principal basis for metaphysics as I understand it. If metaphysics is as um, Aristotle thought, as Peirce agreed, the study of cat the world, reality's categorical form then how are we to find out what it is? And I have a simple example of, of the categorial, which seems to make perfectly good sense within experience, but which doesn't for reasons that we normally ignore. And here it is, physical laws. Physical laws in the tradition of Marburg Kantianism are regularities formalized often with mathematical expression. So the laws of physics, as, as you read about them in a book. Now, what makes the laws of physics laws as typically understood? I've been at seminars in which very significant professor, philosophers of science have alleged that laws are simply sentences. So you press them, mathematically express sentences. Are they anything more than that in nature? Well, they are, but what are they? It was commonplace in the, oh, Braithwaite, Nagel, the time when they were writing the philosophy of science, that these were formalized regularities. But what made them law? Well, they were law-like because they were regular and there was no explanation for the regularity beyond the fact that they were recurrent. So here is a topic for inquiry. What is the natural basis for normativity? I reckon that none of us has an adequate answer. Aristotle talked about universalia in rebus, but why does that solve the problem? Spinoza said that all of nature is necess necessary in the flow and its, its derivations. Why is that? the basis for, for law. 
What is it in nature that makes for, the, for, for normativity? One answer would be God, but I discount that answer. That's for me an answer at the back of the cave, an imaginary answer. What's my point? That if we take metaphysics seriously and we look for an opportunity to pursue it, and the place to pursue it is at the point of inquiry, that point where we come out of the cave, address reality, and ask questions of a sort for which we may not have answers. Aristotle thought that you could make lots of metaphysical progress by simply naming the things we see, substances, the, the four causes, forms, substantial forms. There, seem to be quite, there seems to be quite a lot more than that. The structure of space-time, process, law, perhaps mind, that's the direction I think in which metaphysics would go. Now, why say this? Because I'm aware that for most people in metaphysics nowadays, most, not everybody, but for most, experience is the point of metaphysical reflection. One describes, as within the cave, the character of experience. We can't go farther. We don't try to go farther. My point is that significant metaphysics does go farther. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Weissman. And so we, we can take uh, questions at this point, uh, but instead I said you could raise your physical hand or a virtual one, but I'm gonna change that because I can't see everyone on the same screen. So if you could figure out how to raise your virtual hand for me to keep a K uh, for, for posing questions. And while we're reading, I do know that uh, Eric Vonderloof posed one in the chat already. Would you like to follow up, Eric? Yeah, that, uh, the question I asked in the chat had to do with um, your interpretation of, of Kant. You, you mentioned desire, begirda, and, and imagination, ein Bildungskraft. And as I recall, um, those are rather um, disparate, well, maybe not ein Bildungskraft so much, but begirda certainly is disparaged in Kant, especially in, in, in uh, the ethical text, the second critique and, and the groundwork. And I was just um, wondering if you could explain how you how you um, elevate Begird and I Bildungskraft to to such a high level in in Kant's thought when they're certainly conditioned by Vernunft and possibly also by Verstand. The a the a deduction of the first critique. I'll I'll reread it. I haven't read it in a few years. It just seems odd to me, especially with regard to Begirda. It's critical in the A deduction. What's going on? Uh, just a, a quick follow up. Um, were you actually reading from the A deduction, that passage? The passage you read, uh, David? No, that was from the uh, Critique of Judgment. Well, I think that's a significant fact that it's, you know, the, I, you weren't reading from the deduction or from the schematism. Which, what, what are we talking about? The one about, um, let me just go back to it so we know we're talking about the same thing. Well, the passage where you, you were reading. Been, I have been reproached for following a similar procedure. That one, namely for defining the power of desire is the power of being the cause through one's presentations of the actuality of the objects of these presentations? Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, I'm just not sure how that bears upon the account of the synthesis of knowledge. Because, the because transcendental synthesis, synthesis and the first critique, you know. Because the synthesis requires two kinds of schematism, the a priori schematism and the empirical schematism. And the empirical schematism is chosen by desire. I think that's that's a valid point. So, but it wouldn't mean that every aspect of the synthesis of knowledge for Kant is no. Kant emphasizes objectivity in one's schematization, but that only requires quantity, quality, and relation. 
That's a and, 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 the, and the application of those categories is not determined by desire. No, quantity, quality, and relation are not. But that Kant has distinguished that from the transcendental aesthetic. But insofar as space and time are form of in, forms of intuition, anything in space time is going to have quantity, quality, and relation. So though Kant distinguishes the, the categories, quantity, quality, and relation from the aesthetic, the fact is that the aesthetic already anticipates the categories because there won't be space and time, but for given space and time, anything in space and time, anyone having space-time coordinates is going to have some quality that distinguishes it, some quantity, it's going to fill some degree of some magnitude in space and time, and it's going to have relation to that which is its, which is left, right, center, before and after. So, yes, but the empirical schematism is not uh, a priori. It's, it's determined, it's chosen, it's desired. Well, I just think that makes some difference in your application of the cave allegory to Kant. I don't think so. I, have, I understand that there are um, there are constraints on any interpretation of the phenomena. That's true, but they are minimal. Anything that distinguishes them distinguishes the content in any substantive way is a matter of choice. It's not a lot to be told that it has quantity, quality, and relation. And I ask, is it a crocodile or a, a hummingbird? Both have quantity, quality, and relation. Yeah, well, I, I, I doubt that he would think that that's of minimal importance that you are well, establishing. Okay, we, we, I can't imagine. Okay, okay. Doesn't seem to be very substantial, but okay, I'll grant you, you we disagree. Uh, we, we have a question from Melanie. Melanie, would you like to pose it or would you just prefer that I read it from the chat function? Please pose it, okay. Uh, so Melanie writes, I wonder if you have any thoughts uh, as to how new discoveries in physics, such as the existence of dark energy might influence our learning that we are most likely only aware of a very minimal aspect of what is known as reality and how this might relate to the concept of the cave. I agree. I, 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 th I think this is a very important point. We, it's astonishing. I was reading Quine this morning. I was reading the beginnings of Word and Object just to refresh my memory of some things. It's just astonishing how willing Kant is both to claim um, continuity with science in what he does and um, uh, the idea that reality is radically uh, relative to one's context. Um, I agree. I agree with you completely. Our middle-sized scale has accommodated us evolutionarily to the kind of world in which we live, or the world in which we think we live. But um, there's rather more to it than we know. The sc at scales that are radically different from any we know. And I quite agree. There's quite a lot that uh, we don't know. I think it's marvelous to see pictures of Mars and then see pic find that on Mars, there are things of a scale that we can comprehend. Um, but I think it's misleading. There's quite a lot out there that we don't comprehend and that which is completely out of scale to where we are the COVID virus, for example. We've just managed to produce vaccines that are adequate to it in saving, saving some of our lives, but our comfort with that, there are very few of us who are competent to be comfortable with that scale. Thanks, we're thankful to them, but at both scales, much smaller than ours and much greater than ours, we're largely ignorant probably. Thanks. So we have a question from Vincent Colapietro, and then we'll go to Robert Neville. Thank you, um, David. Uh, so, so I, I just—it's a—it's a—it's a request for clarification. Can you hear me? Am yes. I, okay. Yes. Uh, it's a request. So, so it, it's unclear to me, um, and it's, this is a function of brevity on, on your part, whether. Um, 
the when we're at the back of the cave, we're mired in an illusion uh, because everything is mind spun. It's just coming out of our minds. Or is it the case that even at the back of the cave, we encounter something? And uh, it, we take we take that something to be the whole of reality without question. Uh, but nonetheless, we encounter something, but get what we encounter wrong. Is, is it the case that it's completely mind spun or is it even there at the back of the cave to some degree an encounter with something other than our own minds? It's provoked by something other, shadows, but all the content we read into it is ours. Okay, that's, that's very helpful, thank you. Robert. Uh, hi, David, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I wonder if uh, you could say something more uh, about what's outside the cave. Uh, there are, are two parts that you mentioned. Uh, one is knowledge of the forms as such, and we don't find out much about that from the cave, but from other parts of uh, the Republic. Um, and uh, then there's the good uh, by which the forms are ordered, uh, but uh, to what are they ordered? Well, they're ordered to events of life uh, in the cave, although we don't get much account of what's there. So uh, uh, two things. Uh, could you say more about the nature of forms? And could you say uh, something about the nature of the good? Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm putting these two together uh, in the back of my mind uh, because uh, uh, the uh, application of the forms to the uh, realities within the cave is something that we find by hunt and choice. Uh, and, that, and so the dialectic of uh, judging the forms uh, has to do with applying them in the cave. Well, two things. One, I have, I have very little to say about either. Um, <laughs> The, the forms, the reality of the forms is well beyond um, anything that happens in human life. Um, Plato never succeeds in showing that someone who has gone through um, carpentry to, or geometry, carpentry, geometry to, to the forms of whatever, uh, is when he's become a philosopher king at the, in his early, his or her early 50s, is able to trans, how you translate from, let's say, physics to electrical engineering to being an electrician. Um, the forms would have application universally and necessarily to any and everything that might happen. How they apply to the uh, practicalities of human life is never made clear, except as points of reference whereby they become intelligible to us who have intimations of rational order. Now, as to the good, one of the things I wrote and tried to put into that paper is that the idea of a cosmic good is very hard to make out, hard to know what that is. And I was, wanted to point out that Aristotle made no sense of it. Um, there are goods for one aim or another. There are goods as final causes in Aristotle for all kinds of substantial forms. Squirrels have a good, um, rabbits have a good, we have a good, but they're different goods. They're generically the same, but there is no cosmic good, at least that Aristotle know, knew or that I know. And I am skeptical of postulating a good that is a cosmic good. I don't know what the basis for that postulation would be. So then I, I presume uh, you would be a, a, a mini Platonist, uh, not taking into account the, the forms, which, uh, well, they certainly have a lot of work to do in the Republic. 
uh, or, or uh, the good with which Plato is usually interpreted. See, I don't think they do have a lot of work in the Republic. They are points of reference in the Republic. And the intimation is that the philosopher king would know them and would be able to rule but whereby he or she knows them, but that's not ever shown. Well, one of the things the Republic shows uh, is that there are uh, many different forms for understanding reality. Uh, and uh, one of them is that people are selfish. Uh, and then after a while, Socrates and the boys give that up. Uh, and uh, there is uh, uh, the view that there are three parts of the soul. Uh, it starts off with uh, the, the view that there are several uh, forms of, uh, of persons within the society. And then Socrates slips it over on the boys uh, that every person has uh, uh, all three in some kind of mix. And then- oh, All uh, of that is rather empirical, Bob. One doesn't need the- Oh, no, yes, yeah, that's time. right. That's right. So that's uh, uh, so it is that getting out of the cave is empirical too. Uh, there are those are different forms for understanding uh, uh, life, uh, and uh, th th there are several others that, that go on. Uh, and the question is, uh, which forms are uh, the better ones? Uh, and then we get Plato's account of Socrates, uh, sort of. Uh, sometimes uh, expanding the experience of the of the guys, uh, other times uh, lying to them, uh, bringing them back at at, at the end. Uh, 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 Glaucon and, and uh, uh, the others are uh, uh, believing uh, in uh, an, an afterlife. Uh, Socrates, I don't think, does, but he tells the story of the myth of Ur, and they buy it completely, um, and then draw the conclusion uh, that what's most important for human beings to know uh, is uh, who can help them figure out in their own cases uh, what to do if sometimes they're good looking or uh, ugly, if they're rich or poor, uh, and so forth. Now, all those are the, the, the forms are the rich and the poor and so forth. All, uh, of that is, all of that is very specific to the materialization in our world. None mm -hmm. of it is form. All of it, you may say, is, uh, implies the form of which it is an expression, but none of it requires knowledge of the forms. And everybody, at whatever his or her state in the Republic um, would be able to discern those differences. One would one could be very lowly in the order of um, um, artisans and notice all of that without knowing anything about the forms. So if you mean that for any difference there is a form that it um, instantiates in some way, well, um, I do agree in this sense. I wrote a book once called Eternal Possibilities. I think the forms are possibles. Um, this comes out of Wittgenstein's Tractatus. Reality is um, logical space, and logical space is the space of all, poss all possibilities. But possibilities, the possibility for red isn't red, and one doesn't have to know about the possibility for red to discern red. So our um, knowledge of what you're calling the forms comes only by way of instantiations, expressions, materializations. And I think Plato. Uh, it seems to me that, that, that the, the Republic uh, uh, makes a big move uh, when it, it uh, alt uh, switches from one set of forms to another set of forms that look rather like the first ones, but are differently ordered. Uh, third set of forms, a fourth set of forms, and they all seem to make some sense, but which make the best sense? Well, uh, that, may be. that sounds too much like Quine to me. But on the other hand, um, it doesn't establish in any way the extra mental or extra social reality of the forms. Oh, I don't know that Plato would want to establish the extra social reality of it. 
if we didn't have any imagination whatsoever, we wouldn't know any forms. But the forms are whatever we think, uh, and uh, how they relate depends on how good we are at the deductive capacities for figuring them out. Uh, so they're, they're like different theories. I don't agree. They are anti-REM in Plato. They are not different theories. Well, what about the divided line and the ascent to the non-hypothetical? Well, and so Mike, Michael Bauer also chimed in with a via tertia, perhaps. Um, Michael, do you want to? Sure. Can I be heard okay? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think I'm, I'm with Richard on, on the question of, of desire and Kant. I'm not sure that you get any meaningful desire doing the work that you, David, want to do by looking at the first critique, but I'm suggesting there might be another pathway towards showing desire play an important role in Kant's thought. I'm just reading my chat here, but I'll riff on it a little bit. The other pathway would be something that doesn't emphasize desire at work in the empirical synthesis, but desire at work in the doctrine of the highest good. For Kant, a world in which everyone is virtuous, deserving of happiness, but not actually having happiness is not a good world, is not a uh, desirable world, is, is a defective world. And so he comes up with the doctrine of the highest good, um, where the highest good is understood as a kind of harmony between deserving to be happy and having happiness, a, a harmony between freedom and nature. Um, a harmony ultimately between practical reason and agency on the one hand and, and theoretical reason and, and cognition on the other hand. Um, and so this, there is, according to Kant, a desiring, uh, a striving to bring about the highest good that we ought to engage in, but the desirability of the highest good is not explainable for Kant ultimately on the basis of the moral law alone. For the moral law alone only prescribes that we act so as to be deserving of happiness, not actually happy. So it seems to be there's some kind of desirability of bringing about the highest good in Kant that operates almost at a quasi transcendental level. There's the desirability of harmonizing freedom and nature. So That's I'm just curious. Go ahead. Fine and good, Michael, but the fact is it doesn't seem to say anything about this line from which I read in the Critique of Judgment. That is to say, one wants to. Uh, create a um, some kind of relation between what I want as opposed to what society requires of me and what others want. But we're talking in this book, this is the critique of judgment, and that line I read you is about creating thinkable worlds. Good the question as to what world we think, says Kant, is a question of which semantic framework, which conceptual framework we choose in which to work. Mm -hmm. What we're so, talking about is fine and dandy, but it's a different story, and it's not pertinent to this quote. He's talking uh, about schematization, the conceptual system we use. Maybe what you're saying is fine and what I'm saying is dandy. Let me put it this way. <laughs> Good. Um, I accept that. Yeah, no, what I put it this way, though, that, that if you understand the doctrine of the highest good in terms of the desirability about bringing a harmony between my own agency and a theoretically knowable world, I think you can begin to understand what might be at work in the background of Kant's um, account of, of regulative ideas, where we increasingly want to make the world less alien, less mysterious, less unknown, less fragmentary, as far as we are concerned. So it, it is our desire to bring about the highest good, which finds expression in our aim at making the world more intelligible through science and having increasingly powerful and comprehensive theories. So, so again, I'm, cha I'm channeling Hegel in some way here, but there, there is a kind of desire to make the world not alien to me, which explains why it shows up in the way that it does through certain kinds of categorical frameworks. Does that, does that do it for you? In other words, I'm pushing towards a more ontological, perhaps account of desire, right? I, don't, I care about making the world systematic because I want it to be one with myself. I think couple of things come to mind. One is I think there are anomalies in Kant. I think that the ideas, the very real, the very critical, the critical idealism of the first and second critique is not all of Kant. Kant wants what you say he wants. He wants to bring us into coherence with not just science, but with other people and with a world that is beyond the world as we know it. And he doesn't know how to do that. And the first and second critique, 
the first and second editions of the critique have impaired him from figuring out how to do it because he said the world is a thing in itself, a negative noumena and cannot be known. But I agree that is his aim. It's a quasi religious aim to bring us into a kind of spiritual unity with one another, with the world and with God, the God, the God of, his, of his ethics in some way. And I have no doubt that you're right about the aim. I find myself reading all of that in terms of what he said about the limits of reason in the first and second editions of the first critique, thinking, well, you can't say any of that. But I agree that is a motive of his. He doesn't really want the relativism that you get with Quine or Carnap yeah. or, or the Marburg Kantians. The Marburg Kantians don't think they're relativists either. They think they're getting closer and closer asymptoti asymptotically to a final view of science. The Searer, for example, I think. But on the other hand, uh, if you read the, the, the first critique, both, both editions, quite literally, there's no way you're going to get there because it's all unintelligible, unknowable, undeterminable. So which part, which Kant do you want? The same thing happens with the ethics. Um, with the ethics, uh, there is a desire for beneficence. Everybody should be nice to everybody else and we should all get along well. On the other hand, um, I apply the categorical imperative, which wipes out my good motives. I have the best of motives in helping somebody, but I can't because I can't do it for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it may be that the Kant I want is is the one who who calls himself Hegel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think there's something to that. I think you. I think there's something to that. But notice that Hegel is all together within the cave. The phenomenology of spirit is the phenomenology, the dialectical development of self-consciousness within the cave, all of it. So that what you get in the end is absolute knowledge. Who has that absolute, who can have that absolute knowledge? Everybody. And, and therefore what you get in the end is- Dialectic. Is there, Go ahead. The, what you get in the end is, is there is no inside versus outside of the cave. Yes, yes. But because it's, you have absolutely necessary knowledge, yes. Yeah. But on the other hand, um, someone like Quine or Carnap is going to say all you have is an ample understanding of the conceptual system with which you with, within which you operate. Yeah. So I'm supposed to be moderating, but I, I wonder if it would be uh, immoderate if I if I pose my own question. It wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. Okay. It would not be. Good. So so David, you said uh, I, I give a couple of quotes. You said desire determines how I schematize reality. Uh, and that's, then- that's, that's from this critique of judgment. Okay. Because then what, what my immediate question there is then, well, when arises the identity of desire itself? And you gave that nice example of, you know, stumbling in the dark, and then I don't even know what, what I'm tripping upon, right? Because you yes. also said imagination considers what desire wants and then expresses it in words. Uh, but my basic, it seems to me that desire can't, not only can't know what it wants, but doesn't even have its own identity until, of course, there's an object of desire. And that would seem to me then to mean that uh, desire itself requires a certain transcendental illusion. Uh, so that, of course, uh, it, it's not that the transcendental is so much a condition for the possibility of knowledge as it's a condition, it's, it's a requirement for the production of illusions so that desire can finally be something. Uh, um, but t tell me why that's wrong, I guess. I think it's too um, uh, monadic. It implies that I find out what the objects of desire are without experience of something beyond me, which has shown me as a possibility, perhaps um, witnessed, exemplified in other people and other things. Um, for example, an artist who acquires his or her excitement and ambition from seeing the work of other superior artists is, an, it's not a transcendental illusion it's I see the pictures. Artists very often 
uh, are very eager to show their work to other people and to learn from one another. You see a possibility from seeing what other artists do. And that you see it as both an aim in terms of quality, um, and you see it as an opening of sort that the artist whose work you're observing doesn't see. You see how it opens to you a, a chink, a knit, a niche in something you have done but don't know how to do. And now you know how to go on for doing it. Same thing, the same result we get from reading books from other, other people's books and discovering in their books ideas that are useful to an idea of ours. Um, I don't think it's transcendental illusion at all. It's like going to a restaurant and discovering a cook better than yourself and saying, gee whiz, I could do something like that. It's not an illusion. You've tasted it. You've seen it. What did I, what did I miss in your point? Well, uh, so does desire have an internal identity prior to the to its schematization by the imagination and prior to its being put into words or does identity or does desire only acquire its own identity in those after effects both and i like a certain kind of music and i listen for it but i'm not very good at hearing this kind of music i know very little about it but i know what i like or would like so I go listen to more of it. I listen for more of it. And having heard more of it, I know better what to want. So it's not as though it were a permanent lack or a permanent acquisition. I learn to do, to go in directions for which I've acquired skill, discipline, taste, cultivation, All right, thank you. Um, uh, Macy. What did I miss? I don't know necessarily that, that you missed. I don't, I don't know that you missed anything. Um, yeah, I can, I can take it up with you later, should I so choose. And I may not so choose. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm going to turn it over to May at the moment. OK. Thanks so much, David. I very much enjoy uh, your talk. I, I'm just wondering. Uh, about inquiry and how you're talking about engaging reality and conducting inquiry. How do you, and, and it sounds as though you're quite confident that you're making progress as a result of such inquiry. Now, how are you so sure that you're actually making progress and acquiring new skills and getting better and not <laughs> the reverse? Depends on the- least, Depends on the inquiry. Uh -huh. If I'm taking piano lessons, then I can tell that I can play now what I couldn't play um, six weeks ago, a year ago. If it's a question of um, finding um, what heat is, and I have identified the source of heat as caloric, I went backwards or I didn't go forwards. Many inquiries don't progress, or they go the wrong direction. And one isn't always sure. Good. Now, if I may follow up, so when it comes to metaphysics and our examination of reality, what then are the standards for saying that we have made progress? I think that's a, a, a good, deep question. It's partly explanatory power, but let me give you an example. Um, Plato's Timaeus says that things in space, space is a receptacle, and the principle cons for constructing things in space is triangularity, right triangles and isosceles triangles. Um, by the time we get to Descartes, 
geometry turns out to be, at least is proposed to be, fundamental to the account of materiality. In space-time, it's geometry that explains certain properties of matter, a principle, altogether properties of matter. That is, the wax experiment in the second meditation, the difference between hard and soft wax is the geometry of space-time, the way it's deformed one way or the other. By the time you get to general relativity, space itself has geometrical structure. Those are advances in metaphysics as they nourish physics. Now, if I may follow up, why haven't we already arrived at all of those answers in Plato with the divided line? Which, if you right, read the intelligible section, especially the, the section that uh, leads the line. Yeah. to the form, uh, right? Those are the mathematicals and the uh, sciences, scientific demonstrations. Yes. Now, why isn't that account uh, that which enables us to explain the realm of perception and also the realm of imagination in a cave where everything relies on <laughs> numbers? Right for their struggle. You know, not everything does. The forms don't. Um, but I agree. The figure, of the divided line, is brilliant. Um, it articulates the allegory of the cave in ways that are missing in the allegory of the cave, principally with the geometricals. Um, he has not turned the geometricals Descartes-like into algebra, into al the algebraic. But um, it is a brilliant anticipation. I agree. But if your question was, as it started out to be, why isn't that enough? Because, well, it was a, a tremendous stab in the dark. Brilliant. Absolutely, you know, mind-bending, but not everything. All right, thanks. So uh, I don't have any current questions on the docket. Uh, if someone, you know, has them, uh, you know, feel free. We are at an hour. Uh, as I said, this is our inaugural meeting, so we don't have any precedent about how long it should or or shouldn't last. Uh, but does anyone have any dire questions or comments? Let's see. In the chat, Michelle post something. Michelle, do you want to ask this or do you want me to read it? Or? You have to unmute yourself, Michelle. Thanks. Sorry. Taking Sorry. David's point, um, I'm not sure that I get this right, but um, okay, so I see per spaces the idea of um, cognitions, cognitions themselves are at the borderline of impressions. Cognitions can only proceed from other cognitions. Um, Peirce refutes Zeno's paradox. Um, and, and denies any requirement of origins in any way. And the reason for all of this is because activity requires space and time. So it's illogical for Peirce to suppose anything else. And the logic that he's building from has come from Scotus's illit of logic, which is an attempt to um, do away with any kind of platonic dyad or any kind of uh, presumption of continuities that don't come from experience itself. Where does Peirce, now this, this is rudimentary, but I, I would really like to know where Peirce can succeed where Quine doesn't. And I'm asking because I don't know, uh, but I'm not sure where to situate, David, your, what you do with Quine in your discussion? Well, a huge difference is scientific, what Peirce calls scientific method, hypothesis. I don't see anything of hypothesis in Quine. Quine is all about stipulation. The, the use of categories which come, I don't even know how they come in Quine. Um, okay. 
I think they come because one is one operates within this system of of current priorities, what works, what doesn't work, what what's been what's been established, what hasn't been. But in purse, there is hypothesis and the hypothesis can always exceed whatever was depending on the imagination, the the fruitfulness of the imagination of the hypothesizer. Mm -hmm. So right. it's always in a kind of breakthrough possibility because somebody might have an idea that nobody had before. That's right. Yeah. And, right. and every progress invites extrapolation. Extrapolation, analogy, or generalization are three ways to extend anything we have achieved already. Extrapolate, analogize, generalize. Now, if those are three possibilities for thought, for imagination at any point. So um, you're never necessarily stuck. It's a lack of imagination that leaves you stuck. A lack of imagination and a lack of data, which would provoke or justify um, or confirm the um, elaboration that you introduce. Right, so so experience, oh, I'm sorry. No, artists or composers, Stravinsky can do whatever Stravinsky wants to do. He has an idea, he does it. He doesn't need further evidence. That's, that's the advantage of the artist. The hypothesizer needs evidence. Stravinsky provides his own evidence. Mm -hmm. But it's in a growth way. So there isn't a different, there isn't a separation between the scientist and the artist in that regard, because no, creativity no. itself grows yes. from other experiences and inspiration. But again, coming out of other ideas, consensus, conflict, yes. but yes. yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I want, you know, you, you appeal to Stravinsky and he doesn't require other evidence. I take this as a, a definition of the or, originality. Or, original is something that doesn't follow a model, but it first produces it, its own model. Or something that I wouldn't know, um, how, how should I say, I wouldn't, or, original is that where something's possibility first appears to me only when I first see that it's actual. So I go look at the La Jaconda, the Mona Lisa or whatever. And I'm like, I couldn't even imagine such a thing were possible were it not for the fact that I now see that it's actual. So the original is where act precedes potency, if it will. Uh, would, would that work for you, David? No. No, okay, why not? Take Mozart, Beethoven. I once went to a, uh, a performance of the Philharmonic here. Uh, this but a, before we had the, the, uh, the plague. And I went back and I told a colleague of mine who's herself a musician. I said, you know, Mozart, Beethoven was the smartest person who ever lived. And she's a physicist philosopher. And she said, no, you, not, not Newton or not Einstein. No, I said, they're extraordinary, but not Beethoven. Um, Beethoven went farther than anybody. Potency was, he, had, he thought it and wrote it down. It was potent until he wrote it down. There are original people. Einstein is an example, general relativity theory. People who discover things that others had no way anticipated. Do it your way, Tyler, and you're only gonna get repetition. Okay. Um, do, uh, so uh, if, if there are other questions, I don't wanna jump on anyone's toes, uh, but if there's not, I'll at least, you know, uh, everyone who's now, thank you for coming. Uh, we hope to see you all again. Don't forget the call for papers that I mentioned at the beginning. If this is the sort of thing we think I have a good idea, I'd like to present it at this venue. Uh, then again, we have a vetting body, send a, the proposal, the paper, however you'd wanna do it to secretary at metaphysicalsociety.org. And uh, I'd also like to take this occasion to make a plug for our next meeting, which we do know will be approximately for a month from now. I don't remember the exact date. May 21st. May 21st, same time? Yeah, uh, yes, four o'clock. May 21st, also a Friday, four o'clock Eastern time. And our own Robert Neville uh, will be giving the paper. I would like to make one thought. Anybody who's not a member, but would like to be, and um, membership is very cheap. And if you're a member, you'll get a copy of the paper before the talk, and you might find that useful. Yeah. That's particularly for my paper. 
which goes on for a ways. I'll only talk about the first half, but uh, it helps to read more. Good. Well, thank you all for your time, participation. I agree with Melanie, wonderful discourse and discussion. And um, yeah, hopefully sooner, May, May 21st. First. First, May 21st. I'll Four see you all then. Four Ciao. Good, thank you. Thank you everybody for the thoughts. <clears throat>